Okay, hi everybody, and uh, thank you for coming out again tonight. It's really great to see so many people still coming out, and I can't believe that this is week 10 of our Birds of Newfoundland series. Uh, it's been really fun to see some of the same names over and over, and I hope you guys are getting a lot out of this series. Um, today, we're going to get going here, and uh, today we're going to focus on species at risk. So some of these will be species that we have talked about before uh, in some of our earlier presentations, and some of them will be new um, because uh, we, we didn't cover them in earlier presentations on purpose. Uh, before I get going, I should introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard this 10 times already, um, I'm Catherine Dale, and I am coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas and also of the Nocturnal Owl Survey here in Newfoundland. And uh, with me tonight monitoring the chat is Jenna McDermott, who's the assistant coordinator for the uh, Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, so she'll be keeping an eye on questions in the chat and helping me out that way. Both of us work for Birds Canada, uh, which as many of you know, is Canada's voice for birds. So we are a nonprofit whose mission is to advance the understanding, appreciation and conservation of wild birds and their habitats. And uh, I finally managed to change the number of volunteers on this slide, so it is actually correct now. Uh, Birds Canada runs programs across the country, and most of those programs are citizen science based. Uh, and what that means is that they rely on people like you going out and collecting data and submitting that data. And each year we have more than 70,000 volunteers nationwide who go out and participate in Birds Canada programs, which is really amazing. Uh, we could not do the work that we do without you. Here in Newfoundland, we are relative newcomers. Uh, so Birds Canada established an office here in Newfoundland in 2019. Uh, and we run two programs here. The first is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, and what that is, is a five year citizen science project to map the distribution and the abundance of all of the species of birds that breed on the island of Newfoundland. Um, and so what we're creating is maps like the one you can see there for the evening grosbeak, where each of those colored squares uh, is a place where evening grosbeaks have been found to breed on the island of Newfoundland. Uh, as you can see, we're talking about species at risk tonight, so evening grosbeaks are not incredibly common in Newfoundland, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to fill in that map a little bit over the next three years. And if you're interested in hearing more about the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, uh, please come out to next week's webinar where we're going to be talking about exactly what the project is, how it's set up, and how you can participate if you're interested now that you've gained all of these amazing birding skills. Uh, the other program that we run here in Newfoundland and Labrador is the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, and so this is also a citizen science survey. It runs between the 1st of April and the 15th of May every year. So uh, it's actually starting at the beginning of, or sorry, at the end of this week, which is really exciting. Uh, and what this survey involves, for those of you who didn't make it out to the OWL webinar, um, essentially volunteers take on a predetermined route of 10 stops, each separated by two kilometers. And at each of those stops, they play um, a broadcast that involves um, silent listening periods and owl playback and they write down all the owls they detect. Uh, so I'll just put our little plug in as usual for the uh, nocturnal owl survey. Uh, we've got some amazing coverage in Newfoundland. We're, uh, we're now up to 53 routes in Newfoundland uh, with another 10 on the way and four routes in Labrador. But if anybody is interested in either taking on an available route or um, establishing a new route near them, especially if you happen to live in some of our big gaps, like on the Northern Peninsula or uh, South Central Newfoundland or the Buren uh, or the Bayvert Peninsula, we would love to set up some routes in those places. Uh, so send me an email if you're interested. And finally, just before we get into our species at risk, of course, I'd like to acknowledge all of our partners and sponsors. Um, a breeding bird atlas in particular is a huge amount of work and we wouldn't be able to do it without uh, the partnership and the support of all of these organizations who have been really, really helpful. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna talk about today, species at risk. Um, just a little bit of intro, we're gonna talk a bit about the state of Canada's birds, and we're gonna briefly go over species at risk legislation in Canada. I know nobody wants to talk about legislation at 7.30 on a Monday night, uh, but I find often it's a little bit confusing when you're talking about species at risk. So just to make sure we're all on the same page and have the same base knowledge. Uh, and then we're gonna go through 15 species today and they're all listed there. Uh, so for each species, we're gonna talk about IDQs. We're gonna talk uh, in some cases about species that they might be confused with. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about their um, ranking in terms of being at risk. And finally, of course, we have our 
ever-present quiz, it's going to be a little bit trickier today. Uh, so I've made some changes. It's a little bit different. All right, so starting with the state of Canada's birds. So I'm sure you've all noticed that at multiple times during this webinar series, we've talked about various species being at risk or in decline. And I wanted to start tonight's webinar with a little bit of an overview of how Canada's bird populations are doing. And so to do that, I went to the State of Canada's Birds, which was a report published in 2019, uh, and draws almost on almost 50 years of data from a variety of sources. Um, a lot of it comes from breeding bird surveys and breeding bird atlases. I'm just gonna take a moment here to point out those are not the same thing because I also get confused by that. Uh, so a breeding bird atlas is a five-year citizen science project like what we're doing here in Newfoundland. You get a picture of what's going on with bird populations at a specific time. And then in theory, you repeat the atlas 20 years later. A breeding bird survey is a little bit like an owl route. It's a route of 50 stops that you go out and run every summer. Uh, and so it's a rolling survey, it's consistent, um, and we get a lot of great data from breeding bird surveys. Um, so really the take home message, uh, what this graph shows you is the change in bird populations since 1970, and they've grouped the birds by family. And so you can see that some of our birds, for example, waterfowl and birds of prey, uh, are actually really making amazing comebacks from historical lows. And in a lot of cases, we can thank conservation programs for that. Um, however, we've also got three groups of birds, the shorebirds, the grassland birds, and the aerial insectivores that are still declining extremely rapidly and are in trouble. Uh, so what do we do? here in Canada in terms of protecting species at risk? Well, our big piece of legislation is the Species at Risk Act, or SARA, as I'll probably refer to it for the rest of the night. Um, and for those of you who don't know this, it was adopted in 2002, and its purpose is to prevent wildlife species in Canada from disappearing, and also to provide for the recovery of species at risk. And so what the act does is it lists species as extinct, extirpated, so no longer found in a given area, endangered, threatened, or a species of special concern. Um, and so the species are listed this way on what's called Schedule 1, so that the SARA registry, and under the Species at Risk Act, it is illegal to kill, harm, harass, capture, or take an individual of a species that's listed in Schedule 1 as endangered, threatened, or extirpated. So actually, SARA's prohibitions do not apply to species of special concern. Um, but once a species has been listed under SARA, the legislation mandates a couple of things. First, it mandates the uh, creation of a recovery plan. Uh, so if you've got an endangered or a threatened species, we have to come up with a recovery plan, how we are going to help the population grow. And if it's of special concern, it mandates the creation of a management plan uh, to try and keep it from becoming endangered or threatened. So that's the first thing Sarah mandates. And then the other thing is that uh, it mandates that species be reassessed uh, by, by the um, community, committee for the on the status of endangered wildlife in Canada. And uh, they will look over it periodically to determine if it should remain on the registry and whether the listing level should change. So I mentioned the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, or CASIWIC. Uh, what CASIWIC is, is an independent advisory panel that was created to provide recommendations on how to classify species at risk. Uh, so essentially, they are arm's length from the government. Um, the, the committee was created in 1977, and it's supposed to be an independent panel to provide scientifically sound classification advice on all wildlife species at risk of extinction. Uh, and so essentially, each year, the committee meets to assign risk categories for all the species that are included in its mandate. And under SARA, the government of Canada takes CACIWIC's designations into consideration when establishing that registry of species at risk. They don't always do what CACIWIC has advised, but they often do. Um, and so wildlife species that are designated by CACIWIC as threatened or a special concern, they may qualify qualify for legal protection under the act, but they don't actually have it until they have been listed on the registry. And then just to throw a, a little bit of extra information in there, um, another piece of legislation that often applies to uh, avian species at risk is the Migratory Bird Convention Act, uh, which was passed in 1917, so more than 100 years ago now, uh, to implement the Migratory Birds Convention, which was a treaty that we signed with the US in 1960. 
And uh, unlike Sarah, the Migratory Birds Convention Act applies on non-federal lands. So Sarah actually only applies on federal lands, but it only applies to birds listed under the Migratory Bird Convention, which you think would be all migratory birds, but that's not actually the case. Uh, it does not include all migratory birds. Sometimes it does include birds that are migratory. Uh, and so there are some bird families that, or sorry, it does include birds that aren't migratory. And there are bird families that are not included. Um, for example, ospreys, kingfishers, all of the corvids, so the crows and the jays, uh, cormorants, all of the owls, none of them are protected under the Migratory Bird Convention Act. And that's really because it was less about whether the bird migrated and more about whether at the time that the uh, treaty was signed, whether they were considered a pest species or valued. Okay, so those are <coughs> the three pieces. <coughs> Here we go again. <coughs> Those are the three pieces, pieces of federal legislation that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and then I also wanted to throw in that there is provincial legislation in all of Canada's provinces designed to also protect species at risk. Uh, so the species that are listed under provincial legislation, which in Newfoundland and Labrador is the Endangered Species Act, are not necessarily those that are protected federally. Um, although when uh, the when Kasiwik recommends protecting something federally, that is often taken into account by the provincial government as well. Um, and so the Endangered Species Act applies to species, subspecies, and populations native to Newfoundland and Labrador, not including marine fish, uh, bacteria, and viruses, and introduced species. I, I don't know of that many people who want to protect bacteria and viruses. Okay, so those are sort of the four uh, bodies or pieces of legislation to keep in mind when we're talking about endangered species. So the next thing I'm going to do is go through the list of 15 species at risk. Uh, the species that we have chosen here, they don't all breed in Newfoundland um, in this case. Uh, so most of them do, but there are a couple that don't or that we're not sure if they do or not. Hopefully the Atlas will tell us that. Uh, but we have focused on species that are listed under the Federal Species at Risk Act. Um, so there are some provincially listed species that are not included in tonight's presentation. And we're going to start with the piping plover. So many of you probably remember this bird from uh, our presentation on February 14th on uh, shorebirds and game birds. So piping plovers are small plovers. Uh, their range includes the Atlantic coast, the Great Lakes, and the Great Plains. Uh, but there are actually two subspecies in Canada. So the subspecies that's found in the prairies and the Great Lakes is the uh, Circumcinctus subspecies, and that's different than what we have in Atlantic Canada and Quebec, which is the Melodus subspecies. Overall, though, Canada contains over half the global breeding range for piping plovers, uh, which is quite scary because a 2011 survey found that there were just over 450 breeding pairs across the entire country. So if that's half the population, that's alarming. Uh, the habitat that these guys like, uh, at least in the Atlantic area, they like sandy ocean beaches uh, along or in the plains and the Great Lakes region. Uh, they like lake shores, rivers, alkali wetlands. And in all these places, they nest above the high water line in sandy areas with sparse vegetation. So uh, just a reminder of some of the ID cues that you can use when you're trying to figure out if something is a piping plover. Um, you've got orange lakes, You've got a narrow breastband, which may be incomplete, and you have just this dark headband between the eyes, and then a light sandy gray back. Um, and this light sandy gray back actually works really well for them in terms of camouflage because it helps them uh, blend in to the beaches where they nest. So when they crouch down in a tire track or a footprint in the sand, they can almost entirely disappear. Uh, before we move on from the piping plover, I did want to take a minute to uh, go back over the species that you are most likely to confuse the piping plover with, and that is the semi-palmated plover. Uh, so both of these are roughly the same size, small plover species. Uh, they look quite similar, but semi-palmated plovers are not listed are as at risk. Uh, so the biggest cues to distinguish between piping plovers and semi-palmated plovers, first, semi-palmated plovers are darker. Um, and so uh, Megan Boucher, who's a, a great birder in Newfoundland, she said that the way she thinks of it is that the semi-palmated plover is wet sand and the piping plover is dry sand. Um, so you're looking at a much darker bird with the semi-palmated plover. And then there's a difference in the facial markings. 
So uh, semi-palmated plovers look a bit like they're wearing goggles. Uh, they've got this headband, but they also have a nose band. Whereas with the piping plover, you're just looking at the headband. Uh, and then the semi-palmated plover has a thicker complete breast band, uh, whereas you have a narrow, sometimes incomplete breast band on the piping plover. Um, so those are, those are the key cues to look for when you're trying to make sure you have a piping plover. Uh, details about the piping plover's listing. So uh, the Melodus subspecies, which is the one in Atlantic Canada and Quebec, was first added to the Species at Risk Registry in 2003. And in fact, both species or both subspecies are listed as endangered in Canada. And the biggest threat to the piping plover is the loss or degradation of habitat resulting from recreational use of beaches. So the piping plover's big problem is that it likes to be in the same places that we like to be in. However, it really, really doesn't like to be disturbed. Um, so things like ATVs, off-leash dogs, or even people just out for a walk on the beach uh, can cause a plover to abandon its nest. Um, the other thing is that garbage that's left behind on beaches often uh, can attract predators like red fox, raccoon, ring-billed gull, crows, uh, and all of these will quite happily eat piping plover um, eggs and nestlings as well. Uh, so in several Canadian provinces, uh, including New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Ontario, Birds Canada actually has a piping plover specific uh, citizen science program which monitors and protects the birds during the nesting season. Uh, here in Newfoundland and Labrador, Birds Canada doesn't do that, but piping plover populations are monitored and protected by a cohort of organizations, including Environment Canada, uh, Intervale, and the Halapu First Nation. So we do have a number of piping plover beaches here and they are monitored on these beaches. Okay, the next species at risk that I'd like to get into is the bank swallow. And this is one that we haven't covered before. Uh, so this is Canada's smallest swallow, but it's also one of the most widely distributed birds in the world. Uh, so this guy is found on all continents except Australia and Antarctica. And in the old world, they're known as sand martins, but that's the same thing as a bank swallow. Uh, and they're called bank swallows because they nest in burrows in banks and sandy cliffs, uh, which means they also really like gravel and sand piles and construction sites. And they'll actually dig the burrows themselves uh, using their feet, their wings, and their bill. And they nest in colonies. So sometimes you get as many as 2,000 bank swallow nests occurring together. Uh, here in North America, numbers have declined more than 90% since the 1970s. So bank swallows are definitely in trouble. Um, the way to ID a bank swallow, the big thing that you're going to be looking at is this brown band across the breast. Um, that is the easiest cue to identify a, a bank swallow. You've got a pale belly and a white throat and they're brown above. Uh, but some of you may remember from the uh, session on other passerines a couple of weeks ago that young tree swallow females can also be relatively brown. Um, so the best cue to use is this breast band uh, for the bank swallow. Um, keep in mind it's very small swallows, so and it likes to hang out in flocks with other swallows. So if you do see a large group of swallows, take some time to look them over and uh, see if any of them seem a little bit smaller than the others. Uh, so as I said, Bank swallows are in trouble. Uh, they are listed as threatened under SARA. That's a 2017 listing. We don't currently have a listing for them in the province. Um, what's going on with the bank swallows? That is a good question. So bank swallows are aerial insectivores. And you'll remember from that um, state of Canada's birds graph that aerial insectivores uh, are one of the two bird groups that has declined most severely since 1970. Um, so they feed almost exclusively on insects in flight. Uh, and generally speaking, aerial insectivores are not doing well, but also generally speaking, we're not quite sure why that is. Uh, so for bank swallows particularly, loss of breeding sites is a major threat to them. Um, so they're relatively tolerant of human disturbance, but a lot of the things that we do to change the habitat, um, so erosion control, flood control, road building projects, uh, these can actually result in a loss of habitat. The other thing is, as I said, they're often attracted to construction sites that produce appropriate habitat, but those projects may end up destroying the habitat before the nesting season ends. So we sort of lure them in with a false promise of habitat. Uh, changes in food availability may also be an issue. This is thought to generally be an 
issue for aerial insectivores, uh, particularly with pesticides causing declines in insect populations. Uh, and pesticides can then also accumulate in the bodies of adult and young birds, which can affect their health and reproduction. Uh, and then finally, for a lot of these birds, you'll notice that climate change is an issue. Uh, so for bank swallows and other aerial insectivores, climate change may be causing what's called a phenological mismatch. Uh, so what that means is that the insects uh, are shifting their reproduction earlier in the season. So you get a peak of insect abundance that no longer completely lines up with the peak of the barn swallow and bank swallow nesting season. Uh, so when they need the most insects is not anymore when we have the most insects. So that's a problem again for many aerial insectivores. And we'll move on to another aerial insectivore who has many of the same problems and that is the barn swallow. Uh, so like bank swallows, barn swallows are found throughout the world. Uh, they are in fact the most abundant and widely distributed uh, swallow species in the world. So they breed throughout the Northern hemisphere and they winter throughout much of the Southern hemisphere. Uh, they're slender birds. They're very agile in flight. Uh, anybody who's ever tried to catch a swallow for banding purposes knows this, they're quite agile. Uh, and these guys often fly quite low, so they'll skim just mere inches over the surface of the water or of land. Uh, barn swallows once nested in caves throughout North America, but now they build their nests almost exclusively on human-made structures, hence their name, barn swallows. You'll often find them in barns. Um, their nests are these cup-shaped stru cup structures made of mud and dry grasses, uh, and they're built by both the males and the females. Uh, you'll find them under eaves, under barn rafters, under bridges, in culverts, that kind of area. Uh, so there isn't much around here that looks like a barn swallow. Um, you can't see much of the back of this bird, but they are a steely blue above. You can just see the color on the back of his head there. They have long pointed wings and these sort of tawny beigey underparts. Um, that does vary throughout their global range. So birds from Europe look a little bit different, but here you're looking for tawny underparts. And then the big cue is this long forked tail. And apparently, according to legend, the reason that the barn swallow has a forked tail is because the barn swallow stole fire from the gods uh, and brought it to people. And so in retribution, an angry god hurled a firebolt at them and singed away the middle tail feathers. Um, as it turns out, actually, this long forked tail is a really important uh, sexual signal in barn swallows. And so um, the, the length of the tail and the symmetry of the tail feathers uh, is something really important when they're choosing mates. Um, it's also important to note that the upper, uh, the, the color of the upper part, so that steely blue above, does change a little bit depending on the angle of the light. Okay, so as I said, barn swallows have a lot of the same problems as bank swallows. Uh, they are also listed as threatened. They were also listed in 2017, and they also don't have a provincial uh, status under the Endangered Species Act yet. Um, they're aerial insectivores, and they have declined over 46% between 1966 and 2014. And again, we're not 100% sure why that is. Um, in the 19th century, they were hunted for, hat, for the hat trade, uh, but obviously that has not been the case since the passing of the Migratory Bird Convention in 1917. Um, so probably a lot of the same problems. Um, so loss of breeding and foraging habitat is a big issue. Uh, originally, barn swallows would have benefited from the growing human population in North America because they're happy to nest on human-made structures. Uh, however, this hasn't proven um, beneficial recently because at least for a while, swallow nests on structures like bridges and buildings are, were destroyed either during routine maintenance or because uh, the droppings that accumulate underneath them are, were considered unsightly and unsanitary. Um, and then they have the same problem in terms of changes in food availability, partly due to pesticide, and the same issue with climate change where they, the peak of their breeding season may not coincide any longer with the peak of insect availability. Okay, so we will move on now from our aerial insectivores. We'll take a break from them for a minute and we'll move on to one of our other most threatened groups of birds and that is the grassland birds. So the bobolink is a classic example of a threatened grassland bird. Uh, they're related to blackbirds and bobolinks are quite uncommon in Newfoundland, but like many of our less common breeders, they can be found in the Southwest corner of the province. 
Uh, their habitat is grassland. They like uncut pastures, overgrown fields, meadows, agricultural hay fields, that sort of thing. Uh, so as you can see, the male and the female bobolink look quite different. So I've got both of them up here. Um, the male is, it's almost like he's wearing a tuxedo backwards. So this, this guy is the male here. He's black below, uh, black and white above. So he's got a white rump and a white back, and then this yellow patch on the back of his head. And bobolinks are interesting because they're actually the only North American bird that are light on the back and dark underneath. If you think about other species, it's almost always the opposite way. And that's actually for camouflage and flight because uh, the light color of the underbelly will blend against the sky when a predator is looking up and the dark color of the back will blend against the earth when a predator is looking down. Uh, but bobolinks like to be a little bit different. So they've got their clothes on backwards basically. Um, Females are a little bit less distinctive, but what you're looking for uh, when you look at the female, so you've got brown below and a brown streaky back, but the nape is not streaked. So the back of the neck here is not streaked. They have brown stripes on the crown and a dark eye line, and then a large pinkish bill. Um, so these guys might look a little bit more like sparrows than blackbirds too, but they are uh, more closely related to blackbirds. And I've got the bobolink song to play here. Uh, I say this a lot, but it's definitely one of my favorites because I think they sound like R2-D2 might sound if he was having a meltdown. So it's kind of a metallic, bubbly, rambling sound. Um, it's a mixture of sharp high notes and buzzy low notes. And in the spring, the males will actually uh, give this song while they're giving display flights um, low over grasslands. So they'll flutter their wings. Uh, and when they're doing that, their white rump is particularly visible. So I will play the bobolink song or try to. So, I mean, you, you just have to think it really does sound like R2-D2 if somebody asked him an impossible question. Play it again, why not? Uh, so bobolinks are numerous, but they've undergone steep declines in the last 50 years. So 65% between 1966 and 2015 in the US. Um, so they're listed as threatened under SARA, also listed in 2017, and provincially we consider them vulnerable. Uh, so the main reason for bobolink decline is a loss of their native prairie habitat and other grasslands. Uh, and changes in land use as well. So we turn a lot of these areas into agricultural fields and bobolinks can nest in hay fields and they often do, but then their problem is that makes them vulnerable to accidental mortality because hay fields are often mowed before nestlings have fledged, uh, making them essentially sit sitting ducks for the mower. Um, pesticide use can also be threatening to the species, although that is mainly on their wintering grounds in South America. And uh, they were actually hunted as agricultural pests in the Southern US and may even be hunted for food in some places uh, such as Jamaica. Okay, so now red crossbills. And I know that Jenna covered white winged crossbills uh, a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember if she covered red crossbills. They're very alike, but uh, as you might suspect, the main difference is white winged crossbills have white on their wings and red crossbills do not. Um, like white, -wing, white winged crossbills, they are nomadic rather than migratory. Uh, so they wander in these flocks and they're looking for coniferous forest stands that are rich with cones. They only breed when they find stands that have enough cones to support successful breeding and feed their young. Uh, and sometimes that does mean that they breed in the winter. And of course, the main feature of a crossbill is this distinctive crossed bill. So the end, the tips don't meet, they cross over each other. Uh, and those are adapted for opening cones and extracting seeds. Um, so the ID cues for a red crossbill, of course, the big one is the crossed bill. You look for that, you know you've got a crossbill, then you look at the wings and see whether or not there's white on it. Uh, male red crossbills are reddish overall. Females, again, a little bit less showy. So you've got a bird that's yellowish overall, um, but both of them have darker unmarked wings. Um, some individuals may show wing bars, but they, they won't have white. And so some of you may have been surprised to see red crossbills on this list uh, because they're relatively widespread and numerous. Uh, but 
here we need to think about the subspecies. So there are eight subspecies of red crossbill, but one of them is found only on the island of Newfoundland, so the Perkna subspecies. Uh, Newfoundland red crossbills are larger than those found elsewhere, and they have distinct vocalizations. So there are noticeable differences between the song of Newfoundland red crossbills and those of the crossbills in other parts of North America. Um, so this subspecies, the Perkna subspecies, has declined alarmingly, and it was originally added to the Sarah Registry in 2005 as endangered. Uh, it was downlisted to threatened in 2019. Uh, but the provincial status is still endangered. And there are an estimated 500 to 1500 individuals on the island. So that is not a huge number at all. Uh, so threats for red crossbills include a loss of habitat uh, due to deforestation, insect infestations, and changes in fire regime um, with human habitation. And then they also have to deal with competition with non-native species. And in particular here, I'm thinking of the red squirrel, which is an invasive uh, species in Newfoundland and a direct competitor for food. Okay, now we will change gears entirely and we'll go to the ducks. Uh, so another species at risk in Newfoundland is Barrow's goldeneye. And there are three separate populations of Barrow's goldeneye worldwide. Uh, but we're talking about the Eastern North American population where we have approximately 4,500 individuals. Uh, these ducks are most common in Quebec, uh, but they do use Newfoundland and Labrador during molting and wintering. And this is one of those species where we don't know if they breed here. Uh, it's thought to be likely, particularly in the long range mountains. Um, and if you look at our Atlas uh, checklist for the province, we consider them rare breeders. Uh, but we are very interested in evidence of breeding for Barrow's goldeneye. They like shallow freshwater lakes in subalpine and alpine settings, um, and they like water in coniferous or aspen woodlands because these breeding lakes really need to be near treed areas so the birds can find nesting sites. Uh, they nest in uh, wooded or open country near a lake or pond surrounded by dense vegetation, usually in a natural tree cavity. Uh, so it's something like an abandoned woodpecker hole or um, they will nest in uh, nest boxes as well. And they usually go back to the same area to nest. In the winter, you'll find them in sheltered salt saltwater habitats like bays, harbors, and inlets, um, or sometimes in interior rivers and lakes if they remain unfrozen. So ID cues for the Barrow's Goldeneye. Some of you may remember this from Jenna's excellent ducks presentation many weeks ago now. Um, but what you're looking for on the males is that, of course, bright golden eye. And then they have really a triangular head with a very steep forehead and then a straight black bill. They have a white marking behind the bill and in front of the eye, and it's crescent shaped in the Barrow's golden eye. Um, the wing is black with white spots, and they have this black spur that extends down the shoulder. Uh, females are a little bit trickier as female ducks usually are, but you've got the same head shape, which is a good cue. Um, the bill is different colors, so it's a black bill in the male and a yellow bill in the female. They have a brown head and a gray body. And again, just to talk about what you might confuse a Barrow's golden eye with, uh, I wanted to compare the common versus Barrow's golden eye. Uh, so they're very similar in appearance, as you can tell. Uh, but one of the big cues on the male is the shape of this white patch behind the bill. So in the common golden eye, it's round, and in the Barrow's golden eye, it's that crescent shape. Um, another really important cue is that the body on the uh, male um, common golden eye is more white, and it completely lacks that black spur that you see here on the Barrow's golden eye. So on this guy, you've got white with just a few dark lines, whereas this is a black wing with some white spots and that uh, noticeable spur. Females are trickier as always. Um, often the, cue with, or the clue with females is to look for the males, um, but you do have some differences in terms of bill coloration there. And then if you look at them flying, uh, you can also see, so again, you can see that there's more extensive black on the Barrow's uh, golden eye and uh, more white on the common golden eye. And then of course, if you have the opportunity, you can still see that difference in the shape of the white patch. Uh, so in terms of the listing of Barrow's golden eye, they are, uh, the species tends to breed in remote habitats. Uh, so it's difficult to estimate population trends. We don't have a lot of information. 
Uh, but the Eastern Canadian population, as I said, is, is estimated to be approximately 4,000 to 4,500 individuals. Uh, and it's designated as special concern under SARA and provincially designated as vulnerable. Uh, for this species, pollution is a major concern because they tend to congregate in a relatively small geographic area in the winter. Uh, and that area, unfortunately for them, tends to be in important shipping corridors. So they are very much at risk of uh, oil spills and bioaccumulation of environmental contaminants. Uh, they're also vulnerable to timber extraction during the breeding season because they nest in tree cavities. And some of them are incidentally killed by hunters each year. So not intentionally, but it does happen. Um, and then finally, climate change for this species, uh, because it does like those alpine habitats, and those are some of the habitats most affected by climate change. And now we're back to the aerial insectivores. Uh, so this is another aerial insectivore that is declining steeply throughout its range. Um, and that's interesting, the range does not actually currently include uh, Newfoundland, uh, Newfoundland specifically. So there's no record of the species breeding on the island. It does breed in Southern Labrador, and it's an uncommon visitor here in Newfoundland. Uh, it is considered possible that it will breed here, and we would be very excited to discover this as part of the atlas. So common nighthawks are most active at dawn and dusk. Uh, we think of them as nocturnal, but they're actually what we call crepuscular. So they're busiest at dawn and dusk, and they nest on the bare ground. They don't build a nest at all. They just sort of squat and lay their eggs. Uh, so they like flat areas like sand dunes, beaches, forest clearings, and burned areas. They like barrens, and in urban areas, they like gravel rooftops. Um, as I said, there's no nest, but the young are really well protected by uh, camouflage, and actually so are the adults. Uh, so they can pretty much vanish as soon as they land. They're really funny looking birds, uh, common nighthawks. They've got very, very short little legs. Uh, they've got a tiny bill with lots of these bristles, uh, typical of aerial ins insectivores, and they're a mottled gray, white, buff, and black color, as I say, excellent for camouflage. And then if you look closely, there's a little bit of a white patch on the lower edge of the wing. Um, the sound they make is a buzzy, nasal, pink call, uh, and it sounds remarkably similar to another call that we have heard during the, this series. And I'm just going to leave that as a mystery, see if you guys can remember what it is that sounds a little bit like the common nighthawk. So I will play the, the sound now. Uh, so males also make um, what, what's called a booming display flight. So what they do is they fly just above the tree traps and, and then they make a sharp dive towards the ground. And just above the ground, they pull out of the dive uh, and flex their wings downward and the air rushing across the wings makes a booming noise, almost as if a race car has just passed by. Uh, in terms of what you're looking for in flight, the easiest cue to use. Uh, so they've got these lovely long pointed wings with a nice white patch uh, towards the bend in the wing. And so that is really, really useful for identifying nighthawks. So I'll play the sound once more. So it's been a few weeks, but see if you can remember what else makes a peent noise, a nasal peent call. Uh, so as I said, nighthawks are undergoing a steep population decline uh, of 4.2% per year across Canada and 2% uh, in the US. And that's between 1966 and 2014. Um, so our recent understanding is that numbers may have declined more than 50% in Canada since the mid 1960s, but it is a little bit hard to tell um, because nighthawks are very cryptic, as you can tell. So they're very well camouflaged. And because they're active at dawn and dusk, um, it makes them difficult to count during standardized surveys. Uh, and so I will make a point of saying here that Birds Canada has a, uh, it's called a night jar survey um, that they do every year. And they are looking for people to run routes looking for night hawks in Newfoundland. Um, it would be a bit of a thankless survey because chances are you won't find any, but it would be really, really exciting if we did find them. So if you're interested in that, um, that survey is being run by Andrew Coughlin, who is our representative in Quebec, but you can send me an email and I will put you in touch with Andrew. Uh, so the species is listed as 
threatened. Um, it was listed first in 2010. It has been reassessed in 2018, so it is currently being considered for a status change uh, to be downlisted to of special concern, which is good news. Uh, here provincially, we consider them threatened. Um, and again, as a cause of, or as an aerial insectivore, we're not entirely sure what the causes of decline are, uh, but again, it's likely they've been affected by this decrease in insect availability um, due to pesticides. Uh, they've also experienced habitat loss, uh, so not just of their traditional um, open habitats, but also of flat gravel covered rooftops, uh, so there aren't as many of those around anymore either. And also they will forage over the road and sometimes even roost on the road at night, so they're quite vulnerable to road mortality. They're often hit by cars. Okay, our next species tonight is the evening grosbeak, which I believe we have covered before. I believe Jenna covered in her uh, finches and grosbeaks presentation. Um, so these guys are pretty easily recognizable. They're pretty heavy set with obviously that massive bill that they get their name from. Um, they can, however, be somewhat easy to overlook because they don't have courtship displays despite, despite their bright colors and they place their nests pretty high in trees. So that can make them quite fine to, uh, quite hard to notice. Um, they like mature and second growth coniferous forest. Uh, and in the winter, of course, they eat mainly seeds, which they crunch with those enormous bills. Uh, but during the summer, they feed on insects like the spruce budworm. Um, and this is interesting because it's suggested that infestations of these insects, um, as well as an increase in the use of box elders as ornamental trees, may have allowed this species to expand its range considerably during the 1900s. So they, they expanded eastward. Um, these are year-round residents here in Newfoundland, and they're found mainly in the southeastern part of the island, as per a change, um, but they're not regular and often they're only seen in the winter. Uh, so ID cues here uh, for the male, very easily identifiable. Um, you've got a dark head with a bright yellow eyebrow, a large pale bill, and a bright yellow body. Um, the birds have black primaries or the outer wing feathers, and then you can't see it on this particular picture, but they have white secondaries. So the inner wing feathers are white. Uh, when they have their wings folded, it's almost like a white patch on their backs. Uh, and females can have varying amounts of yellow on their bodies, uh, but you're generally looking at a sort of grayish brown body. They also have white patches on black wings and they have a greenish nape to the neck. And then again, that large pale bill. Uh, so evening gross peaks are also numerous and widespread, uh, but their populations have dropped pretty steeply between 1966 and 2015. Uh, this is taken from the Breeding Birds Survey. Uh, and in the east, numbers appear to have declined by almost 97%. So that's a huge drop. Um, exactly why? Again, it's hard to tell sometimes. Uh, so they're listed as special concern under SARA and provincially we haven't listed them at all. Uh, but the reduction in numbers may be largely due to the logging and development in boreal forests. Uh, it could also be associated with disease outbreaks, uh, so things like Salmonella and West Nile virus. And then we also have reduced numbers of spruce budworms and other forest insects, often due to spraying, uh, because we don't like these pests. And that could be having a negative impact on evening gross beak populations as well. Um, and then like many birds, uh, we're seeing a risk of um, climate change that could be shifting their range. Uh, so because it may be shifting the range of the trees that they rely on. So for example, um, balsam fir range is shifting out of New England and the birds may disappear along with it. Uh, now we have another duck, the harlequin duck, um, absolutely gorgeous duck. It's a small, dark diving duck, and it's incredibly distinctive. There's not much you're likely to mistake it for. And it has a very specific requirement for nesting. So they want fast moving rocky streams. Uh, and there they feed on crustaceans and mollusks and insect larvae. Uh, here in Newfoundland, we're mostly, uh, we mostly find them on the Northern Peninsula, but they can also be found in some rocky bays on the South Coast. And during the winter, they're also frequently found on the south coast, particularly just off of Cape St. Mary's on the Avalon. Uh, again, there's not much you can mistake for Harlequin duck. Uh, you've got this slate blue color overall with a very precise white pattern. So they've got distinct white markings and then they have a rusty red flank and then they have this rusty stripe on the head. 
that's the breeding males. Females, as always with ducks, are a little bit more challenging, uh, but they have a round white patch behind the eye and their face is pale between the bill and the eye. Um, and again, sort of look at the size and the shape of the duck and relate it to the male ducks as well. Uh, Harlequin ducks, most, much of the species range is in Northern North America. So it's quite remote and it's beyond the range of the breeding bird survey. So the breeding bird survey is great, but it does rely on people to run the routes. And so if you look at a map of where the routes are, they are mostly clustered in Southern Canada near the US border. Uh, so we don't have a lot of information on the population trends of Harlequin ducks. Uh, but we do know that their wintering populations in Eastern North America are much smaller than the historical numbers from the 1800s. So these were first added to the Sarah registry in 2003 as special concern, and they have been reassessed. They were reassessed in 2013, but no suggestions were made uh, for a status change. Um, we don't really know what the primary cause of decline in harlequin ducks is, uh, but during breeding, um, things that change the running of streams. So uh, timber harvest and hydroelectric development, if they change stream flow and cause silt to move around, that can affect their prey, uh, which would then affect their breeding. Um, so they, the number and quality of offspring they can produce. Um, also, because they tend to congregate on the south coast of the island during winter, close to shipping lanes, they are susceptible to uh, events such as oil spills and polluted runoff. Um, and they can also be caught in fishing nets and aquaculture uh, uh, structures. So that's something to worry about with them as well. And back to the aerial insectivores. You will notice that there is a theme here with the aerial insectivores. So this flycatcher, the olive-sided flycatcher, uh, they are associated with open areas in the boreal forest. Uh, and you'll often see them perched on standalone snags, exactly like this guy in the photo is doing. Um, they really like burned, flooded, partially cut areas. And they'll sit at the top of the trees. They'll sing very loudly. You can often hear olive-sided flycatchers from a long distance. Uh, and they'll fly out to catch insects in midair from those perches. So cues for uh, DQs for the olive-sided flycatcher. Uh, you have olive gray upper parts and a white throat. And then it looks almost like they're wearing a vest. So they've got these sort of dark olive brown gray vest. Uh, the flank and the sides are, are this color, but then you've got white in the middle of the breast and belly. Uh, the head feathers are sometimes raised and actually you can see that on this guy because it gives the head a little bit of a peaked look. Um, you can't see it in this picture and actually you're unlikely to see it even if you can see the wings. They do have pale gray wing bars, but they're very indistinct and difficult to see. Um, like all flycatchers, they like to sit upright and they sing a song that sounds like quick three beers. Um, so it can be heard over long distances and it's usually your first cue that you have an olive-sided flycatcher around. So I'll play that. I'll play it a couple times because it's very short. So just remember the, the olive-sided flycatcher is inviting you over for a friendly pint. Um, so before we go into the listing details for olive-sided flycatchers, I wanted to take a minute to review the flycatchers because we covered the rest of them uh, when we did the other passerines presentation a couple weeks ago. Uh, and flycatchers can be really tricky to tell apart. Luckily, the ones we have here are, relatively speaking, easy uh, for the group, but we, we have these four, and this is what you want to be looking at. Um, sound is always a good way to identify flycatchers, but you can tell these guys apart visually. We've got the yellow-bellied flycatcher, which has that yellowish wash on the belly and yellow wing bars. Uh, and then the least and alder flycatchers both also have wing bars that are here you can sort of see the gray on the wing bars of the olive-sided flycatcher, but obviously the least and alder flycatcher have much more distinct uh, wing bars. So these are our four flycatcher species. And in terms of what's going on with olive-sided flycatcher populations, between 1968 and 2006, the population declined by 78%. Uh, so the species was listed as threatened in 2010. 
but the pace of the decline does seem to have slowed a little bit recently, which is good news. And uh, the species was reassessed in 2018 and Kasiewicz recommended that the status get changed to special concern. Provincially, we do list them as threatened. And the major threat for these guys is the loss of wintering habitat uh, in Northern South America. So it's difficult for us to do anything about that from here in Canada. But there are uh, things that we can look at on the breeding grounds as well. So for example, altered fire regimes uh, and climate change can lead to lower quality habitat on the breeding grounds. And these guys are also likely affected by the, the reduction in abundance and availability of aerial insect prey, like all of our aerial insectivores. Okay, only a few species left to go. Um, so the rusty blackbird, I always thought it got its name from the sound it makes, which sounds a little bit like a rusty gate hinge, but actually no. Uh, this bird gets its name from the fact that during fall and winter, uh, the black feathers on the upper parts of the male are edged with rusty brown. Uh, so during the fall and winter, they actually look quite rusty. And you might think that they molt all of their feathers to have this shiny black breeding plumage, but actually what happens is those tips of the feathers wear off and that's how they get the, the shiny back, black breeding plumage. Uh, rusty blackbirds are opportunistic feeders, but they really like the invertebrates that you can find along the edges of wetlands. And they like wet areas like flooded woods, swamps, marshes, edges of ponds. Um, also interestingly, according to Cornell, these guys will sometimes attack and eat other birds like sparrows, robins, and snipe. Uh, which I have never seen, but apparently it is documented. Uh, so IDQs for the rusty blackbird, you've got a pale yellow eye, a slightly curved bill, and then they're all black with a, uh, a, a glossy greenish sheen to them. Uh, females, of course, look quite different. Uh, so females are brownish to rusty colored. They've got the same pale eyes that you see on the male. And then they've got this pale eyebrow and a dark eye line. Uh, so that's what the females look like. The song of a rusty blackbird consists of two to three notes and it's followed by this rising higher note, which sounds like the creak of a rusty gate. Um, it's much easier to hear that rising higher note at the end than it is to hear the rest of the song. So often that will be your first cue that there's a rusty blackbird around. So even though they don't get their name from this song, it's a very useful way to remember the song, that rusty gate hinge. Okay, oops. Apparently there's random writing in my table here. Um, so rusty blackbirds are one of North America's most rapidly declining species. So the population has actually plunged 85 to 99% uh, over the past 40 years. And once again, we're not entirely sure why. Uh, but approximately 80% of the world's population breeds in Canada. So it, it's an important bird for us to take care of. Uh, the biggest threat to these guys is probably the loss of habitats, uh, wetlands that are being lost to development and reservoir creation. And that's both on the breeding grounds and on the wintering grounds. Um, also, it's possible that the former hunting of beavers uh, reduced habitat availability by reducing the number of beaver ponds available. Uh, we may see that change now that beavers are making a comeback. Um, and finally, rusty blackbirds from northeastern North America have been recorded with unusually high levels of mercury con contamination. Um, again, not sure why that is, uh, but that could also be contributing to their decline. Okay, and uh, our only owl species that, uh, that is considered at risk here in Newfoundland. Uh, Short-eared owls are also called grass owls. So they are an open habitat specialist. They like tundra, coastal barrens, fields, bog habitats, uh, and they have the unusual ability to hover while they hunt. Uh, they forage by both day and night. So you will see these guys during the day and they'll cruise low over open habitats looking for voles and other small mammals. Um, IDQs for the short-eared owl, it's a medium-sized owl. Uh, it's got a rounded head with a pale facial disc and then uh, these bright yellow eyes with black rims. So I believe Jenna said that they look a little bit like he's wearing um, 90s grunge makeup and I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, they do of course have these little short ear tufts which gives them their name, but uh, don't count on using those to identify them because they're often difficult to see. 
Um, they're dark streaked. And notice the difference between the chest and the belly where you've got uh, more buff coloration and more, uh, more and darker streaking on the chest than you do on the belly. Uh, in flight, notice that you've got these dark bars on the underwing and you've got long broad wings. Uh, and short-eared owls are not particularly vocal, but their primary song is a series of a dozen or more hoots. <laughs> And then both males and females will give barks when defending the nest and offspring. Okay, and I'm gonna need to step this up. Uh, I'm gonna apologize now. We are gonna go a little bit over 8.30. I thought we could get through our 15 species with no problem today, uh, but of course, feel free to leave whenever you need to and the video recording will be available on the website later. Uh, Short-eared owls. The breeding bird survey suggests that the species has undergone long-term population decline across Canada, but populations in the Atlantic provinces may actually be stable. Uh, it was placed on the SARA registry in 2012, um, and it was listed as of special concern, and it has also been reassessed in 2021, but here they suggested actually that it should be uplisted to threatened, and the status change is currently under consideration. Um, in province, we list them as vulnerable, and the main issues for short-eared owls are increased development and recreational use of coastal areas um, has resulted in habitat loss, and they really like these large uninterrupted tracts of open grasslands, uh, so they're particularly sensitive to habitat loss and fragmentation. Um, they may also here be limited by prey abundance and competition for resources, as well as predation of eggs and juveniles. And another bird of prey on our list is the peregrine falcon, uh, also covered by Jenna earlier in this series. So these guys, you probably know them as formidable hunters, um, largely based on their speed. So their diving speed can reach up to 100 meters per second. Uh, they mainly hunt other birds, and they've got these really strong facial markings that look a little bit like a pilot's helmet. So that's an easy way to remember them. These guys nest on cliffs, uh, and here in Newfoundland and Labrador, they're found mainly in Labrador, although we do have records of a couple of nests, I believe, on offshore islands off the Northern Peninsula. Um, so cues for ident identifying cues for the peregrine falcon. This is a large falcon with a slate gray back and uh, wings, dark barring on the belly, which goes all the way down through to the undertail there. You can see it. Um, They've got this bold dark mustache, which, which is the facial markings that I mentioned, and then long pointed wings uh, that when perched actually meet the tail. So peregrine falcons are kind of a nice success story. Uh, here we have um, a species that was listed as special concern in 2012, and it was reassessed in 2017, and it recommended to be downlisted to not at risk at all. Uh, so peregrine falcon populations, like many birds of prey, really plummeted in the 1950s to 1970s due to the widespread application of DDT, um, which was used to control insects, but also caused eggshell thinning in many birds of prey. Um, but since DDT was banned in Canada, these populations have been rebounding successfully. Uh, they do still have to contend with the issue of pesticide use on their wintering grounds in South and Central America. And here we also have problems with human disturbance of nests, which um, is, yeah, uh, on cliffs could be an issue, um, illegal harvest for falconry, and a lack of suitable nest sites, and possibly a lack of food availability here. Those could all be threats to peregrine falcons. Okay, and just two species to go. Uh, so the gray cheeked thrush. Um, I feel a little bit funny doing this particular slide because we have one of our resident experts on gray cheeked thrush here tonight. Jenna did her master's thesis on the gray cheeked thrush and knows far more about them than I do. Uh, but we have two subspecies of this thrush. Uh, it's closely related to the Bicknose thrush. And in fact, these two were only uh, recognized as separate species in 1995. Uh, but gray cheeked thrush has a much wider range. So it, uh, it's found from easternmost Russia through Alaska and across Northern Canada. Um, however, that most of that range is a separate subspecies, uh, Alicia, 
which stretches across most of the continent. And then here in Newfoundland, we have a different subspecies, the Minimus subspecies, which is found only on the island um, in habitats associated with Southern boreal forest. So mature spruce forest with heavy tall shrub cover, um, coast conifer thickets and old growth balsam fir forest. I DQs for the gray cheeked thrush. Um, here you're looking for a grayish face with no eye ring and no buffy color on the face. Uh, thrushes can be quite tricky. I will show you a comparison slide of our thrushes here just for you to have a look at. Um, but the key, key here is to look at the face and note the, the grayish aspect of it as opposed to the buffy coloration on some of our other thrushes. Um, we have whitish underparts with grayer flanks and the intensity of this spotting on the breast varies among individuals. Their song is a series of, they're, they're furry notes, but they, they have that ethereal flute-like sound that most thrush songs do. Um, so I will play that for you. So the ending of that song, uh, which is the, this phrase that's lower and descending in pitch is pretty consistent among individuals, but the beginning part can vary a lot. Okay, and so just here's the comparison slide I promised of our four thrush species. Technically the robin is also a thrush, but I haven't included it because they're pretty easy to distinguish. Uh, so your ident identifying cues here for the hermit thrush, you're looking for this rusty red rump and tail, which really contrasts with the color of the, black, of the back. That's the big identifying cue for hermit thrush. Um, for a very, it's a darker thrush species than the rest of them. It's more red brown um, and the face is plainer. Um, so you can also keep in mind the very are not incredibly common here in Newfoundland. They're really only found in the Southwestern corner of the island. Uh, for the gray cheek thrush, you've got this face with no buffy coloration on it, whereas for the Swainson's thrush, you can see they look like they're wearing these buffy eyeglasses and then they've got more buff coloration on the face. So those are your cues for the different thrush species. And in terms of the gray cheek thrush, this was a formerly relatively common species, particularly on the northern peninsula, the northeast coast and the Avalon Peninsula. Um, but data from the Breeding Bird Survey suggests a pretty dramatic decline in population, so almost 95% in coastal parts of Newfoundland over a 40-year span, which is an incredibly fast decline. So they went from being pretty common on Breeding Bird Survey routes to quite uncommon. Um, they are not currently listed under Sarah, but uh, our very own Jenna McDermott is currently working on the Kasiwik status report so that they can make a recommendation. Uh, they are listed as threatened provincially. And um, we're not entirely sure what's going on with gray cheek thrush, but one of the uh, suggested reasons is that the introduced species that they have to contend with, particularly the red squirrel, um, could be a reason for their decline because red squirrels will happily eat nestlings and nests. And so they may be impacting reproduction. Uh, we may also have an issue of habitat loss and on migration, we may be, these guys may be connect, um, colliding with man-made structures like wind turbines. Okay, and for our very last species at risk, we're actually returning right to the beginning of this presentation uh, series when I talked about the leech's storm petrel. Uh, so this is a small robin-sized seabird. Um, they're the only storm petrel that breeds in Newfoundland and Labrador, and they're a member of the tube nose family. So you can just see that little tube nose on this guy. Uh, so they share traits with albatrosses and fulmars, uh, such as using a sense of smell to guide navigation. Um, they have social interactions and an extremely long lifespan, so up to 40 years, even though this guy is about the size of a robin, and robins definitely do not live for 40 years. Um, so even though these guys weigh under 50 grams, they can fly up to 1,200 kilometers offshore to find food during the breeding season. Uh, so the ID cues for the leech's storm petrel, you've got long angled arched wings. You've got a pale carpal ball bar, so this white reaching the leading edge of the wing. You've got short legs, so they do not stick out past the end of the tail, and then a long tail with a deep notch in it, and of course that tube nose. Um, just briefly reminding you of the difference between a Wilson's and leech's storm petrel. Um, so 
The big things you're looking for here, first of all, that carpal bar on the Wilson Storm Petrel doesn't reach all the way to the front of the wings. Uh, the tails are quite different. So whereas you've got a forked tail on the Leech's Storm Petrel, you've got a uh, flat tail on the Wilson Storm Petrel and it's shorter. And then finally, combination of shorter tail and longer legs means that the legs stick out past the end of the tail, whereas that does not happen on the Leech's Storm Petrel. That being said, you probably don't need to worry about it because the Wilson Storm Petrel uh, breed in Antarctica and they're rarely seen on land once they travel away from their breeding grounds. So they're up here for their winter, um, but any storm petrels you see anywhere near land is probably a leech's storm petrel. And the listing information for leech's storm petrel. Uh, so Newfoundland is a stronghold for this species and represents up to 50% of the global population. Um, and in fact, we have the world's largest colony on Bakaloo Island, uh, which had 6.6 .6 million birds in 1985. Um, but when surveyed 20 to 30 years later, we're looking at a 50% decline of individuals. So 3.3 million storm petrels have gone missing, um, which is quite terrifying. Uh, they are not currently listed under SARA. However, uh, the, they have been assessed by Kasiwik um, and they were recommended, they recommended the species be listed as threatened. So that was 2020. So we're waiting on that decision. And currently they're not listed provincially. Uh, threats for this species include light pollution. So um, they are foraging in, near, in areas near offshore oil platforms and they are drawn to the light. Um, also, sometimes when the nestlings fledge out of their burrows, they will come towards the onshore lights rather than flying out to sea. And then they'll land on roads and get run over. Um, food availability, we're expecting the food that they eat and the distribution of the fish that they eat to change with climate change. So they may either have to fly farther or they may have to eat lo uh, lower quality food. So that could be an issue. Um, pollution and oil spills and also mercury again for these guys. Uh, storm petrels, particularly in the eastern part of their range in Newfoundland and uh, St. Pierre and Miquelon do have really high levels of mercury in their bodies. So that's also a possibility. And then because they're a burrow nesting bird, they are quite vulnerable to predation as well. Okay, so. We have eight questions. I'm gonna go through them really quickly because it's already almost 8.40, uh, but we have covered the species at risk in Newfoundland in great detail. And hopefully you guys all feel a little bit better equipped to pick them out when you see them. Uh, so the first question, I will launch the poll here for those of you who are able to stay. Uh, which of the following species would call a place like this home? So people seem pretty sure of themselves on this one. As I said, I've changed things up a little bit with this quiz. It's not all identifying pictures. Um, and uh, I've tried to bring in some of the species that we talked about in earlier sessions, because you know, if I ask you to tell the difference between a bobolink and a red crossbill, I'm pretty sure everybody would get that. So I wanted to make it a little bit trickier. All right, any last minute guesses? We're at 85% participation. So I'm gonna end the poll. Get your guesses in quickly if you've got any. Okay. Uh, so in this case, an overwhelming majority answered right. That is a barn swallow, or sorry, a bank swallow colony, not a barn swallow colony. Um, some of you guessed leeches storm petrel, and that is a reasonable guess because they are burrow nesters, uh, but they actually prefer to, when possible, um, put, put their nests in the tuckamore, so sort of vegetated areas, rather than these steep vertical banks like this. Okay, uh, next question. Okay, so what species is this? testing your flycatcher knowledge. Oh, 
Okay, any, any more answers? We're at 80% participation, which is sort of my cutoff. Get in any last minute uh, answers you have. I'm gonna end the poll now. Okay, you guys are on the ball tonight. Again, an overwhelming majority said olive-sided flycatcher, and that is the case. Uh, this is an olive-sided flycatcher. Um, you can see this really classic vest. So olive-sided flycatchers look like they're wearing a vest with sort of whitish stomach and a whitish throat. And then you've even got that nice little peaked head from where the head feathers are raised. Um, it's a little bit tricky uh, because you can't see the wings and the wing bars or the lack of any obvious wing bars on the olive-sided flycatcher is one of the excellent ways to identify them. Okay. And next question. Next question is a sound question. So I'm going to play this sound and you guys can tell me in a second what species you think it is. I'll play it once more. Okay, we seem to be stalled at 75% participation. Any last minute guesses from anyone? I'll play it once more so you can hear it. All right, we've hit 80, yes. All right, so again, very on the ball. 66% of you said bobolink and bobolink is indeed the case. Uh, so this is a bobbling sound. Remember, this is like R2-D2 having a meltdown, basically. Um, the Rusty Blackbird song is shorter, so it's just a couple notes ending with that uh, hinge-like sound. And the gray cheek thrush sound, you're listening for that ethereal thrush-like tone, um, which is really quite distinct. Okay, next question. What species do we have here? Okay, we're over 80% participation. Get in your last minute guesses. Jenna just told me I'm being very tricky and I am tonight, tricky, tricky, but we're getting to the end of our series. So I think it's fair. And despite my trickiness, over 50% of you got it right. So this is indeed a killdeer. And it was a tricky question because I didn't put up a picture of a killdeer today. Uh, so it is a plover. Um, so those of you who guess piping plover and semi-pollinated plover, it is indeed a plover. Uh, but instead of a single breast band, you've got this double breast band. So uh, both of the both the piping plover and the semi-pollinated plover, you're seeing just a single one. Also, killdeer are quite a bit bigger and lengthier than the piping plover and the semi-pollinated plover, which are small. Okay, halfway through our questions here. So we have another photo ID question. What's, what species does this female belong to? Well, people are pretty sure of this one. Okay, so any last minute guesses? Okay. 
okay, I think I fooled people by being tricky last time and showing you a bird that are giving you a bird that I hadn't shown you this evening. 92% um, of people did get this right. It is an evening grosbeak female. Uh, pine grosbeak, again, you've got the very large bill, so that, that is a reasonable guess, uh, but you're seeing, um, instead of a yellowish color, uh, reddish for, for pine grosbeaks. Okay, so another tricky question here. Uh, because, you know, you guys are up for it, clearly. So this is my question. I'm going to play you this call. This is the call of a common nighthawk. I, the, the picture is there for a reason. So that is the call of the common nighthawk. It's that nasal peent noise. And I want to know if you remember what other species covered during this bird ID series makes a very similar sounding call. So a buzzy nasal peent noise. People are a little less sure on this one, although the answers are coming in pretty, pretty quickly. Any last minute guesses for over 80%? Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. And again, despite my attempts to be tricky, you guys are all on the ball. So the, the correct answer is the American woodcock. It makes a noise like this. Okay, so that's the woodcock. Um, a Wilson snipe, the sound that we know them best for is a winnowing sound, which sounds a lot like a boreal owl call, but it's not this paint noise. A bittern makes a really difficult to describe kind of gulping, booming noise. And spotted sandpapers make tweet, tweet, tweet calls. Uh, so yep, the correct answer was an American woodcock. Uh, and I thought I was being so tricky. All right, thank you, Mr. Woodcock. Okay, so next question. I had to ask, bring in the thrushes, which thrush do we have here? Answers are coming in a bit slowly this time. Give it a couple more minutes. Okay, any last minute guesses? There was a last minute guess. All right, I'm gonna stop us here. Okay, and this time I did manage to trick you. So 60% of you said gray cheek thrush, but this is not a gray cheek thrush because it does have those buffy eyeglasses and buff on the face. So this is actually a Swainson's thrush. Um, it's a bit difficult to see if it's a hermit thrush, I realized, because I said the big cue there is the rump and the tail, the coloration of those. Uh, and for a very, you're really looking at a sort of unmarked face and a darker brownish red color. Uh, but the big, big clue for this guy is that buff on the face. All right, and one final question for tonight. And it's another photo identification question. And it's another tricky one because there are species there that we have not covered tonight.
Okay, we've hit our 80% cutoff. So get in your last minute guests is and oh, we've got 90% answering this question. Nice. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. Uh, so once again, my efforts to be tricky have been thwarted. So 67% of you got that right. This is a common grackle, not a rusty blackbird. Um, I'm glad nobody said it was red wing or a bobolink. Excellent. Uh, the cue is that it's a grackle. So you do have a yellow eye and you have the same greenish gloss. Uh, the big thing that I'm noticing here is just this huge bill on it, much bigger than we'd see on a rusty blackbird. And then the other thing, it is a bit difficult to see, but a nice long tail um, that, that goes down much further than you would expect a blackbird tail to go. Okay, well, thank you all for uh, bearing with me and sticking around right until the end, even though we went late. Uh, and I'll just open it up for any questions if anyone has any and remind you that next week we have our Atlasing 101 webinar. So if you want to put everything you've learned in this series to use this summer, that is, uh, that is a perfect opportunity to learn how. And then our final presentation uh, will be when Jenna teaches us about birding by ear on April 11. Thanks, Catherine. That was a really great presentation as always, lots of good information. Um, there's no outstanding questions in the chat that we haven't addressed um, throughout the presentation, but there's been a lot of people commenting on um, some of these birds that they've seen come to their feeders that they see in their yard, which is really interesting uh, across the province. Cool. So we can take a look at that chat later on to see where Definitely. everyone's seeing everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, those are perfect sightings to report to the Atlas. Yeah, for sure. Jenna, would you like to add anything about the gray cheek thrush that I didn't manage to get? Oh, I think you did a lovely job. Well done. <laughs> All right. Well, high praise indeed from the expert. Okay, well, if there are no questions, uh, I'll just thank everybody for coming again, and we'll call it an evening and hope to see you next week. Perfect. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks a lot. Take care. <laughs>